Um, I'm Chrissa, I'm the founder of Sunshine Support, and I'm going to be talking to you this morning about the return to school. So if you know anyone at all who has concerns about the return to school, or is, has a child that's really struggling with the return to school, by all means, tag them now. Um, hopefully some of you can join me this morning. I'm very aware that uh, evenings are usually preferable, um, but I'm often asleep. <laughs> so I'm here this morning with you. Um, <clears throat> hopefully some of you can see me. I'm just making sure that we are live and everything is working. Uh, bear with me. I'm sure that we are. Yes, I think we are. Yes, I can see there's some of you commenting. Perfect. Morning, Natalie. Natalie says, my son is currently at home and I'm trying to negotiate with him about going in. It's a, a familiar conversation, I think, for so many of us. <laughs> really sorry, I've got the lurgy, I think. Mm. So, as I mentioned, hopefully I think there's quite a few of you watching now, so we're all good. Um, I'm Chrissa. The, the founder of Sunshine Support. And I'm gonna be talking to you this morning all about the return to school because it can be absolutely blissful for some, but an absolute nightmare for others. Um, so like I say, if you know anyone who is struggling or worried about the return to school, or it's just not happening, tag them now and hopefully this will be quite beneficial. I'm gonna get through quite a lot this morning, um, but do say hello say hello and let me know where you're actually watching from because I always find that quite interesting because sometimes we have people, I think it's mainly from the UK, um, but sometimes they're overseas because guess what? This problem is a global problem. Um, so by all means as well, share any ideas or questions, anything at all, do use the chat um, and say hello. I can see some of you already saying hello. Um, it's popping up that we've got lots of comments, however. Facebook isn't allowing me to see them, so just bear with me. <clears throat> Hi, Shamina from Birmingham. Um, let me see, who else have we got? Laura from Portsmouth. Soraya or Soraya. I've got a friend called Soraya who spells it the same way. So um, sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, from Milton Keynes. Uh, we've got Shell. Morning, Shell. Morning, Rebecca. Morning, Sarah. So we've got lots of people watching. Um, like I say, please do share with your friends and tag them um, because I think it's going to be quite useful for them if I can get through without coughing. <laughs> so there's loads of anxiety at the moment. We know that. Um, it seems to be the trickiest return to school. Sometimes after Christmas is worse than after the six weeks holidays in September. Um, and I think it's because our it's a shorter holiday, obviously, it's quite long for some of us, two weeks. Um, but I think a lot of parents are out of routine as well. Um, and so we have strange eating times and eating habits over Christmas quite often. Um, and I mean, I was off for most of Christmas, so my kids got to see me around. There was no sort of running between work and asking them to be quiet whilst I jump on a Facebook Live or anything like that. So it was really, really different. So it's really tricky sometimes because what we fail to remember or fail to acknowledge is that over Christmas, there is a lot of connection and downtime quite often. Um, I know that with my kids this year, we have focused mainly on connection and we've not really done much at all in terms of leaving the house, but we have connected so beautifully. So I knew that there would be that separation anxiety um, and that's healthy. You know, um, children want to be with their main caregiver. It's the person who keeps them safe and makes them feel safe. So um, don't ever feel guilty for that. Um, but some kids will thrive on the return to school. And hooray for them, honestly. This is not about sort of disregarding the good. <clears throat> but for those kids, they probably don't need as much support as the ones who are really struggling to attend. So it's wonderful if your kids can just go back into school seamlessly. Um, but some may really struggle to attend um, and some might not make you back at all. 
Um, maybe they didn't finish last year on a good note. I know one of my children, oh my goodness, she was punished for a disability at the end of last term. And she was left feeling absolutely dreadful. We have spent the entire Christmas helping her to recover. Um, but the in feeling of injustice is real. And she's a real, and she's a chip off the old block, I suppose, <laughs> in the fact that when she feels that something is wrong, she'll really speak up and be very loud about it. And sometimes inappropriate. She she does have a communication uh, disability. Um, and her feelings of injustice are valid, of course. So it's been really tricky um, to sort of, it feels almost wrong as a parent to say, you know, this is somewhere where something has happened that you don't believe in, but you still have to go. And I think that a lot of our children feel like that. They might not be able to verbal verbalize their feelings, but they feel like that. And all of these big emotions are really valid. They stem from somewhere. And the reasons for those big emotions can provide our children with enormous barriers to school, maybe even School avoidance. We read this week in the press that one in five children are not attending school regularly and they are forecasting that to increase to one in four. There are so many reasons for this. I've made it very clear on our Facebook page and on social media channels that everything in life progresses medicine, science, law, accountancy, you think of all the jobs, you know, retail. My goodness, I when I uh, started in my career, um, I started in the retail sector and I remember taking checks. I remember when the card machines went down, we used to have those card machines that were like paper and you would just do the carbon copy thing of somebody's card. We have come a long way with technology. We're now using our mobile phones to pay for our goods. Not many of us, particularly as ADHDers who lose everything, carry cards around. Everything's through Apple Pay or our watches. How things have progressed. I'd like to think that actually I only started in the retail sector like five years ago. However, I'm not that young. <laughs> <laughs> so it was about 20 years ago. But let's look at the retail sector. In the last 20 years, <clears throat> we have seen payments change. We've seen shop layouts change. We've seen online, the birth and, and complete success of the online retail world. We've seen the death of the high street. You think how much change has happened in retail in the last 20 years. Now look at the education sector. Nothing has changed nothing okay we get to pay, pay for our kids dinners online nothing else in terms of their actual education has changed we've seen enormous strides forward in the the field of special educational needs i have somebody who's very close to me who's been a specialist teacher um since the 70s and things looked very different in the 70s and you wouldn't have wanted your child to have a diagnosis because where they put them in the 70s was not where they put them now so things have come on leaps and bounds in the send community despite in it feeling like despite it feeling like it hasn't however in education in its entirety, nothing has changed. Education now looks very much like education when I was younger, but the pressure is so much greater. I remember feeling really wanted in school. I felt like I was part of a community. I'm still firm friends with the children that I went to school with at age three in South Wales, and they are the most beautiful people. I absolutely love engaging with them. Be and I also know a lot of my teachers still because we had a firm safe secure connection there were some bad ones obviously there's always a bad one um however i think the pressure is so great now we're seeing teachers with declining mental health we're seeing people just being taken advantage of you know i've got a friend who is completely taken advantage of in her role as a teacher teachers are leaving the field so quickly um, because it's not what they trained to do. This is not what they, they felt their vocation was. I know so many teachers who say, I want to leave, but I don't know what I'm skilled to do now. I'm institutionalized. I went to school, which is an institution. I went to college, which is an institution. I went to university, which is an institution where I was trained to re-enter the workplace 
as an institution. I don't know life outside this institution. And it it's a real strange entity. Now, when we look at that, <clears throat> is there any real surprise that our children are struggling to attend school? There are so many reasons, which I will try and touch on today, but I will be doing far more work on this in my webinar next week. Um, I have a my school avoidance webinar next week. So if you want to come along to that and you need the details, just comment below. Um, so not that I'm making this uh, political, however, Labour MP Bridget Philipson proposes to fix the problem that our children are facing. So she's saying that she is very concerned about these numbers of one in five, um, and she's very concerned that that's going to increase to one in four. However, she vows to fix this problem of uh, school non-attendance, and she's going to use artificial intelligence to do that. It made me laugh and cry in equal measures this morning. Um, we're battling against, as parents, as teachers, we are battling against a well-funded, ill-intentioned entity that calls itself a public service. So what can we actually do? The little people on the ground, the people who are affected, the people who are suffering, what can we do? So this is what we're going to chat about this morning. Um, I don't have all the answers, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm a bit of a mouthpiece and I have very strong opinions backed up with evidence. However, I don't have all the answers. So please do share your ideas and your viewpoints on the chat because let's empower one another. Create a sense of community because community is what it's all about. Like I've just mentioned about, you know, my favourite school time when I was in primary school, I felt like a very important member of a community because we were all important members. Um, and we can see, I don't know whether you've been watching, it's become my uh, special interest. <clears throat> and my colleagues will laugh because it's all I talk about. But the post office scandal, Mr. Bates and versus the post office. Um, I don't know if I can talk about this without crying. The whole program made me feel so inspired, so motivated to continue making change. Um, and so in awe of what they achieved together. And oh, my goodness, the tenacity, resilience, endurance that they had to go 20 years to gain justice and I'm not sure that they will ever gain the justice that they deserve because you know it's a much bigger uh, conversation to be had in this Facebook live but anyway what I noticed in that program is uh Alan Bates talks about the little people uh meaning us the the mere mortals um but what I noticed was when there is enough of the little people we can make a difference because when you watch that court case in that program, what is evident is the passion behind those fighting for justice and the lack of passion in the actors deliberately. I'm not saying they're bad actors, they're tremendous actors, but they did, they very much show that there was a very much a lack of passion and more a corporate entity behind post office. So what I'm saying is, what we lack in maybe funding and power we make up for in passion. So we got to stick together. Um, so please do chip in with ideas and inspiration for one another, because this thread is going to be really, really useful. Now, there's so much pressure on our children. Um, some of our kids thrive with all the targets that they're set. For instance, one of the ones I see a lot is be ready to learn. It's a common target set for our kids. It really is. But how many adults actually know what that means? Be ready to learn. It's such a vague statement. And our kids are kids. They're children. They don't have the mental maturity yet to know how to overcome these big emotions and the big stuff that's happening to them to be ready for your teacher, be ready, be ready. So it's like, yeah, disregard your feelings, disregard what's happened this morning, disregard that injustice you felt last term and be ready for your teacher. It's really hard. And along with these sort of soft social targets of be ready and be kind and all those sorts of things, um, 
they also have the pressure of these more measurable targets the schools need for their staff bonuses and league tables and all the other stuff. Um, and teachers tell us they don't like this stuff. They don't agree with all of that. They want to have their autonomy back. They're trained as educators and yet they're put into a system which gives them zero autonomy in order to be able to teach the children in their class. They're to treat them as if they are just numbers coming in. There's nothing that separates the way that they teach from the teacher next door when you look at what's written on paper. And so teachers are also anxious to return to school, which I've already mentioned. Um, but what can we do as parents? Um, what can we do to prepare our children for the return to school? Now, I appreciate that some children have already started, but all of these things I think are still going to be useful. So even if you almost, um, some parents have contacted us and said, I'm just wiping the, the, I'm just right, sorry, not wiping, writing this week off. This week is a non-starter. We're going to have to use it as a week of prep. Um, and some parents are fortunate enough in terms of work and things to be able to do that. So regardless of your situation, I think that these are going to be really useful tips. Um, and this video is recorded. It will be on our Facebook page forever. So you can come back to it at any point that you want, even, you know, Easter holidays, summer holidays, whenever. So first of all, my number one piece of advice is focus on you. You can't tend to a fire if you are already on fire. Um, and so many people disregard this. <clears throat> They're like, oh God, it's that hippie stuff. It's not, it's science. If your brain is calm and you're feeling good, then it's going to take more to rile you so when your child comes to you and they're dysregulated, if you are regulated, you can then regulate them. It's science. Um, but it is very much like fire. You can't put fire out with fire. OK, so be the water. <laughs> um, do a little checkup on yourself. How are you feeling? What are you doing to keep your emotional regulation in check? Um, I mean, I'd love to know. What, what are you doing? Post your comments and ideas. I'll come back to them in a second. Um, now, recently, I did a Facebook Live. I say recently. It's probably a couple of months ago. <laughs> Just seems like last week. Um, but I did a Facebook Live with my fantastic colleague, uh, Kelly Jarvis. And we talked all about how the parental, how parents and their journey through education as children can also affect their children's journey through education. And I was very, very um, honest in that Facebook Live about my own experience of school avoidance. <coughs> I've got ADHD, didn't know it at the time. Um, I also have Crohn's disease, which I did know about at the time. And um, I was suffering with enormous, what they described as depression and anxiety. As I recognize it now, that was my ADHD and that was burnout. Um, but that wasn't recognized back then. Um, ADHD is so new to us, of course. Um, doesn't mean it didn't exist. Um, but I I was very, very candid and very brutally honest, actually, about how I felt that my own experience affected my eldest child's experience of education and how I have embarked on a lot of therapy to make sure that the, the, that sort of hot potato of school trauma stops with me and it doesn't affect my other children. Um, doesn't stop me from being a, a fantastic advocate for them um, and spotting when things are not right, but at least I'm trying my level best to not let my experience impact them. I won't go through it all again, but I was brutally honest. Do have a look on our Facebook page. You can seek it out on our Facebook lives or videos. Um, but for me, part of that, making sure that my big emotions don't affect my children's big emotions or self-regulation or regulation in its entirety. Um, I'm very keen on self-care. I don't find I'm, I'm past the point. I think I don't know whether it's my age or whether I've had a lot of therapy. I'm past the point of feeling guilty about looking after myself. I see the benefit of looking after me and being able to pass on that to my children but it is really difficult you have to plan it in it doesn't just happen as a happy accident you have to book these things in and you have to protect that time it's something we talk about such a lot here at sunshine amongst our team because we can be pulled into 
other people's problems because that's our job um but it can completely overwhelm us as individuals and overwhelm our families when we're pulled into complex cases um and so we have to protect our boundaries we have to protect our personal time our family time and that extends across your day not just work and life um across everything um <clears throat> i've got quite a few kids um and very little childcare. <clears throat> if not none at all, actually, and a tiny, sometimes non-existent support network. Um, and I work, you know, ridiculous amounts of hours, more than full-time, probably double full-time hours. Um, and I've got no idea how I fit it all in the week um, into sort of my week. Um, maybe it's my ADHD. I've got no idea. Um, but I do know if I don't look after myself, and protect those boundaries and put that oxygen mask on, then I can't function. And I certainly can't be what my kids need me to be. Um, I've got small things that I do every day to make sure that I'm looking after me. So I'm very aware in recent times of my own chemical imbalance within my body. Now, it's something that I've, I've got blood tests and I really look after myself in terms of my chemical imbalance because... It doesn't matter what you do around your health, your eating, your, your physical fitness. If your chemical imbalance, uh, if your chemical balance is off, um, then it doesn't, it, nothing works. So I take supplements to keep myself um, more balanced. Um, I've got a, a skincare routine, which is not expensive or elaborate, but it gives me the opportunity to sit in the morning and at night and just breathe. In peace and quiet. I get up very early so that my kids are still asleep, so the house is in silence, and I have those times for my myself. Breathing, any excuse to have some really good deep belly breathing going on is so important because you can't get a better mode of self-care than breathing deeply. Google the benefit of it on your brain. You will see that the, the most powerful medicine for your brain and for your emotions is oxygen. That's the only thing really that calms your amygdala down. So that's your survival brain. Um, and when that pops up and it's like, ah, I'm in panic mode, I'm, I've got anxiety. The only thing to calm that down is oxygen. And you're not gonna do that by going, <laughs> but there's no oxygen going into your body. So you need to get that oxygen deep into your belly. Um, but it's absolutely fantastic. And there's so many ways to do that. And so many people are afraid to try, you know, deep breathing and the different ways to deep breathe. We have got actually on our academy. We have some guided meditation. I absolutely love it. Um, it's so gentle. And there's a pulsing image on the screen that helps you to know when to breathe. And it calms me right down. It's just wonderful. Um, <clears throat> So that's you, looking after you. Secondly, we need to be listening to our kids. Observe them, observe their communication. It couldn't, it might not be that they're verbally telling you, I don't want to go to school because of this specific thing. It will be probably quite inappropriate. They're young, their brains are not mature enough yet, um, and their communication isn't developed enough yet to be able to identify and troubleshoot in the way that we would love for them to, so that we could help them. Um, your children will be telling you if they're happy to return. If they're not happy to return, they'll let you know. It could be verbal, like I said, or it could be something else. And it's often not appropriate when they're not very happy about it. But what are they telling you? Don't ignore that. Don't ignore it at all. Um, document it, actually. Um, what I used to do, when I was going through my big legal battle before I set up Sunshine Support, the reason I set up Sunshine Support, I had a, a diary that was just for the anecdotal stuff um, that happened with that particular child of mine. And um, 
I found it really, really useful to take that with me wherever <laughs> to show what the pattern, pattern of whatever was going on the week before, what that looked like. So I think it's really important to document it um, as much and however you can. It will come in handy. Um, and remember, you don't have to force your child into school. There's so many comments saying, oh, I forced my child in. Believe me, I say in my all my webinars, I made the mistake of that. I listened to the system tell me that this was the only way my child was going to be educated and that I would be a bad parent if I didn't allow my child to get into school. And I remember, bless her heart, being dragged by her teacher from my car and in her pyjamas just because I turned up to deliver another child to school. And it was, oh, God, now, ugh, it wouldn't happen now. But I was much, much younger and I felt completely bullied by the system, which many of us do. Um, <clears throat> these days, it's much worse in many ways because they have the power to write you these awful legal threatening letters. Um, however, I must say the law and the guidance from the DV is on your side as parents, okay, particularly with mental health. Um, and I'll be covering that, all the law, the guidance, your, your rights. Um, I'll be covering that in my webinar next week. So if you want more information, because I'm doing pre preparing for school today, but if you want to talk more about school non-attendance and your legal rights, um, then we will be covering that in our school avoidance webinar next week. So just comment below and, and I'll give you the links. Um, something else you can try with your children. Again, works for some, not for all. By all means, share your own experiences of this. Try some gentle conversations about school. Um, See if you can dig a little bit deeper, explore what is causing their worry. Be gentle because it could be quite traumatizing for them, particularly if they've experienced something quite um, emotionally overwhelming or maybe even physical, physical pain. Um, and also don't base everything on emotionally based school avoidance. I know that's like a trendy new thing, EBSA, and everything should be down to that. It's not always emotional. It can be physical. Um and I almost feel like, you know, as women, we're told we're too emotional. Oh, she must be. It must be the time of the month because she's emotional. We're always blaming emotions when actually it could be something environmental that's affecting our child. Sensory overload, for instance. We've got tons of these resources on our website. And one of them um, is sensory overload at school. You can download these for free on our website. Um. The sensory overload at school can affect, I don't know whether you can read some of that, come back and have a little look. Um, you can pause this video later on. Um, but basically, sensory overload at school has nothing to do really with emotions. It's to do with, what, what, as, as a neurodivergent person, if I'm in sensory overload, that's a physical attack on my senses. Um, so of course it's going to affect my emotional regulation, but it's not my emotions that are the problem. It's not my emotions at the base of why I'm unable to then perform a task. It's because I've been abused. <laughs> so that, and by the way, feeling abused in a sensory capacity doesn't mean that somebody is to blame. It just means in that environment, it's not very suitable. Sometimes people are to blame. I'm not saying that they're not. Um, we also need to be recognizing signs of trauma. Again, these are all downloadable on our website. By all means, you know, just ask for the link and I'll send, you know, somebody somewhere lovely at Sunshine will send you the link. Um, trauma can happen in school. That is a reason that our children get anxious about going to school. Anxiety in children. This is really good for us to point this out. Again, by downloading these, you can also buy a box of these on our website if you wanted like the hard copies. But downloading these <clears throat> and being able to offer this to school and say, look, my child is exhibiting these symptoms. We cannot ignore this. This is a mental health problem. And by the way, <clears throat> anxiety falls under special educational needs. So you should be getting reasonable adjustments for that. Again, guidance from the DV, Department for Education, along with other stuff, the law, we will be covering all of that to make sure that you feel empowered. We've got another one on there, um, talking about preparing for the return to school. Download it to your phone. Just keep it to hand. You'll always need it at the end of uh, each holidays. Uh, but it's all the stuff. I'm basically elaborating on that one right now. Um, one of the other reasons as well, sometimes our children can't pinpoint what's going wrong. And 
a lot of us recognize that it's not just school that they're struggling to attend. They're struggling to attend life outside their bedroom because in their bedroom, they have no judgment. They have no demands on them to be social. They've got no demands on them to be hygienic. They've got no demands on anything at all. They just get to be themselves and feel safe. And so many of us worry about isolation and everything else. But what we need to be looking at is self-esteem. Because without self-esteem, this is nothing about egotistical stuff. Without self-esteem, we can't function. If we don't have a belief in ourselves, we won't leave our room. And that this is what society and these archaic educational practices, this is what it drives down is self-esteem because people don't feel like they belong. They don't feel worthy. They don't feel like they're enough. And that goes for our children as well. I mean, we felt like that. Let's be fair. We've all had an employment that has made us feel absolutely terrible where our self-esteem has plummeted, um, where we feel absolutely rubbish. That's what it is. Forcing somebody back into that environment is not going to make them better. Then there's school avoidance, or as some people call it, and we hate it, uh, school refusal, which is why we've got it in inverted commas there. Um, this is where things are just not working out and kids just can't make it back in. Um, sometimes that turns into challenging behaviour. Again, all free on our website. Download them. We've got so many of these, by the way. <laughs> But the biggest one that I was hoping to have a copy of, but I think I must have given it to someone because it is my favourite um, infographic, is school climate. Um, school climate is made up of five different things. And basically, if a child's needs don't match the school climate, then you're going to have a mismatch of needs. Sometimes you can't change the school climate. But I talk about that in great detail. There's a lot of information in my webinar next week. So if you want more info on that, do let me know. Um... Now, <clears throat> like I say, be gentle about probing um, as to the reasons why your child is struggling to attend or feel feels anxious returning to school. Um, sometimes our children can tell us. Sometimes they can't tell us. They, and there's a variety of reasons for both, okay? Um, everybody's got a different um, presentation. And presentation comes from, you know, nature and nurture. Um, so it's really tricky sometimes to be able to get that information out of them. Like, for instance, for instance, um, one of my children was attacked by a fellow SEND student a few years ago. Um, and as a result, there was, um, a safeguarding plan put in place to keep the children apart because my child really did not feel safe knowing that that child could do that again. Um, however, just recently, that safeguarding failed um, and the adults involved failed to keep my child safe. And the child who attacked my child was allowed to go into my child's safe space, um, which just happens to be a dark sensory room. So you can imagine, I mean, if you can imagine being attacked and then your attacker turning up in your safe place, which is dark anyway, um, the fear that was induced into my child is absolutely off the scale. Did she then feel safe that the adults in her life in that setting could keep her safe? No, she's lost all faith because that's what happens, you break trust. She doesn't feel safe at all. Um, and due to the nature of how I parent, she was able to explain that to me very quickly um, and really clearly so that I could advocate for her. She was subsequently punished significantly for her outburst as a result of that situation. Um, and so I was glad that she could advocate to me, self-advocate to me and say, this is what I'm upset about. So that I could then advocate for her because nobody listens to children, do they? Um, it, it always makes me laugh when they want the child's vo uh, voice on the EHCP. And I have quizzed so many local authorities on this because when the child's voice matches the intention of the local authority, they applaud the child and they go, oh, yeah, we'll add that bit in. Yeah. But when a child's voice doesn't match that intention of the local authority, they laugh at them and they go, well, we could put it in. But phew, it's a bit funny, isn't it? Because they know children aren't listened to, not unless it matches the narrative of the adults. 
Um, but anyway, back to when I was sort of self uh, advocating for her because she'd self advocated for me, yeah, for herself. Sorry, I'm all over the shop, aren't I, this morning? Um, I ensured that when I was advocating for her, she was present because it was really important that she, number one, felt like I was fighting a corner and that I understood her and that I could, I valid, that was further validation of her feelings. Um, <clears throat> But she could also see, have the opportunity or the teachers could have the opportunity and the adults could have the opportunity to make her a promise that they were going to keep her safe. Um, and of course, the promise comes to me, but sometimes that just falls short. The child needs to hear it as well. So having this sort of uh, co-production, having your child involved in these conversations um, is really important. But what's even more important is that step number one that I mentioned earlier keeping yourself regulated because what you don't want is your child seeing you kicking off um, and getting dysregulated because you're not teaching them something valuable there. Um, but for my daughter, that recovery is going to take time just because she's been made this promise doesn't mean that she's absolutely a-okay. That is going to take time. It's going to take time to build up the trust. Um, but it's essential that these kind of conversations take place um, and if your child is sharing the way that my child has by all means make an action plan that involves them you know they need to be at the center of that action plan um i've mentioned as well you know about school climate because this very much safety fits into school climate but again school climate is enormous because when we say climate we think of temperature um but actually it's checking in i suppose with your temperature in terms of how you feel um walking into a building so it could be the environment in terms of um you know how well kept the school is the the actual physical temperature smells things like that but also the sense of community sense of safety sense of discipline um is it a fair school do they push too hard or not push enough there's so much involved in school climate and tons of research to refer to but i do give you all the links and everything in my webinar next week so if that's something you really would like to learn more about do come to my webinar another one of our specialist educators here at uh, sunshine charlotte <clears throat> has some great ideas when we did one of these um facebook lives back in september when we were discussing the return to school um and charlotte says that uh, and I completely agree, visual and environmental preparation is key. So it's not just about having those discussions, but making it feel like they're back at school when they're at home. Um, so, for instance, you know, if you get them new uniform, wash and dry it. So not only is it sort of soft, but it smells like home when they're in school. So it doesn't feel so, it's not another barrier then. Same with shoes, get them to wear their shoes because I know a lot of children grow quickly. So you might've bought all new over Christmas. Um, get them to sort of leave their uniform out a little bit so they can try it on and it becomes more normal as school approaches. The same with anything really to do with school, bags, anything at all. Um, and another thing that I that, that Charlotte mentioned, which I think is really, really important this time of year, is start to prepare the children's meals at home at the same time as they would have them at school. Because let's be fair, like I mentioned earlier, <laughs> meal times go out the window at Christmas. Um, I don't know whether there were some days where we didn't actually have a formal sit down meal. It was just like a grazing day, like one meal a day, which starts at when, when you wake up and finishes when you go to sleep. Um, but I think that sort of understanding you're back into a routine and having that sort of getting up at a certain time, having your breakfast, getting yourself ready, even if it's not with school uniform and sort of getting back into that routine will make it less of a shock when it actually happens. Um, and I think actually all of our education team talk about visual stuff, um, visual and environmental, monthly countdowns, weekly timetable, visual boards, um, social stories, prepping for school storybooks. Get creative. You could make your own. You could make your own little storybook. Get them involved. Get your children involved. You can also reflect back on good memories from last year. So when you look at term one, you know, autumn term, whatever they call it, um, you can actually be looking at um, giving your child something to cling to a little bit. Oh, do you remember when this happened last term? I wonder if that's going to happen this term. Because I think a lot of anxiety is based on, 
oh, but what if, and it's a negative thing. What if I've got no friends? What if I can't get the school dinner that I wanted? What if I fall over on the way into school? Cling to the positive stuff that happened last year. What if you win another award for your lovely writing? What if you go into dinner with all your friends early again, like you did in the last week of term? What if all the positive stuff, just to give them that slightly different perspective, because that, that sort of teaching will benefit them for the rest of their lives. And it's not something they learn in school. This is something us as caregivers do. Um, maybe give them something to take in um, that is not going to be disruptive, but something they really want to talk about, maybe a photo or something. Um, also speak to the teacher and say, we're having these tricky times. My child is anxious. It might be new. It might be something that's been going on for a while, whatever. But say, look, I would really like to work with you to make this happen. They want to come into school. They're just really struggling to come into school. What can we do? Can we do a little show and tell? Can we, do, you know, there's all sorts of ways. And of course, for older children, it is more tricky because what I'm talking about there is very primary age. By all means, if you've got some other ideas, do share them in the chat. <clears throat> I think one of the most important things you can do as well is validate your child's concerns. Like I mentioned about my child, um, we can teach them how to better um, communicate and we can teach them how to better react and respond to the big things that happen. Um, but just because we're encouraging them to be better people doesn't mean that we can't validate their emotions. So, you know, I can imagine this is a good example. I can imagine that was really tricky for you. If I was like if I was in that situation, I would have been so upset and I would have felt so scared. And all of a sudden you put in names on emotions and feelings to which your child will probably say, well, yeah, you know, thanks, mum, thanks, dad. Um, yeah, that's exactly how I felt. Oh, my God, I feel understood. Um, and then when you're sort of coaching them through, because sometimes our children, big things happen to them and then they don't act appropriately afterwards, we can say, what can we do to get help if we get to that point again? Because no child likes kicking off. No child likes being naughty. Being naughty doesn't exist, really. It's it's a form of emotional dysregulation. It's them saying, I don't know what to do, but I just need to get out of this situation. But how can we teach them to manage that? Because that is one of the that's more important than Pythagoras and um, all the sort of technical stuff and the four different ways to do long multiplication and division. This stuff is going to serve them for the rest of their lives, understanding their emotions, their tipping points and what they can do if they feel distressed. Where can they go and plan that with a school and say, you know, my child is really nervous about feeling dysregulated. Can we come up with a plan with a plan of action? My daughter's speech and language therapist has put like a little toolkit together. And it's something that my daughter has prepared with that. And one of it is very much based on smell. One is based on taste and the other is based on feeling. So as in sensory touch. Um, and so my daughter has, um, she loves a certain perfume that I wear and it makes her feel like she's with me. So I bought her like a dupe and that's gone into the um, little toolkit. Um, she's also got a very soft baby blanket because she absolutely loves that feeling. And she loves Tic Tacs. <laughs> So she has a little box of Tic Tacs and this box is kept with her TA. She has a one to one. It's kept with her TA. And so she's been coached to think, to, to understand where her emotional regulation is. And she will now self-advocate and say, I'm coming out of the green zone. I'm not sure why, but I need some help. And so the toolkit comes out and she's able to then go, yeah, I need a Tic Tac. And so she'll take a Tic Tac and she'll put it back in. And they've got agreements around this sort of um, sensory toolkit or an you know, emotional regulation toolkit. But it works a dream. It gets her. Number one, she's validated. Nobody's saying, well, just crack on. They are saying, oh, no, let's make sure that we can fix that together. And they're co-regulating with a toolkit tool that she designed. These sorts of things can be done. They're reasonable adjustments. Um, 
my child does have an EHCP, but that isn't written in there. That's just something that helps her on a day to day basis. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And she talks about it to anybody who'll listen. So actually, those sorts of adjustments are reasonable, but they have to be within reach. Um, we've had it before where um, these sorts of toolkits have been set up, but they're really difficult to get to. So it could be that only one teacher has the key for the box. That is it. Oh, it's just a nightmare. So make them accessible um, and speak to the teachers. Um, don't expect your child to come up with this magic formula, by the way. They're going to need a lot of coaching and a lot of support and the, the trust that they build up. That's key. They have to feel safe. They have to feel that the connection they have is secure as well. Um, but the child should be really at the center of any action plan and, and school should be involved and parents should be involved. There should be like a three way process going on. Um, but, you know, the nice, gentle parenting stuff. It's lovely and you can do lots of this stuff at home around emotions. Good modeling as well. You know, I I model a lot at home. It's become quite natural for me over the years um, where if something's upset me, then I'll go, oh, I'm really upset about something and I'm feeling quite dysregulated. And that use of language and understanding and naming what is going on scientifically for you is so important for your kids to understand. But we're not just telling them to do it. We're doing it ourselves. And that is absolutely vital. Um, there's stuff that you can do to make your kids feel um, or to help your kids feel like they're still connected to you. If there's some, some sort of sense, um, separations anxiety is what I was going for. Um, like, for instance, those little love hearts that they can have in their pockets, they can squeeze like a squeeze in a heart, is it? Or squeeze in your pocket or a hug in a pocket or whatever they call it. My, my kids have all got them. Um, and they've been known to draw little hearts on their hands and press them when they feel that they need to be connected to me. Um, like I said, my, one of my kids absolutely loves one of my perfumes. Um, and so she um, carries a dupe um, in her toolkit <laughs> and she sprays it on a sleeve or on a little blanket thing that she's got. Um, and that really helps her to regulate. Um, I've also <clears throat> started doing some breathing exercises in the morning. Um, and also adding vitamins into our uh, sort of morning routine and calling them magic uh, because they're going to help my children to feel strong and resilient throughout the day. Um, and they do, it does seem to work, but the breathing exercises really, really work as well. So if you have any ideas, do share them because you might have some stuff that really works in the morning. And then I think it's really important, you know, I, I've talked a lot about encouraging and uh, sort of helping our children with their emotions and anxiety. Sometimes it's gone too far and we have to just accept that this anxiety is way too much. And, you know, if we're truly validating our children's experiences and feelings, sometimes we've got to just admit school isn't suitable. Um, and you know what? School isn't the only place that children learn. So don't force it. So many parents now are opting for EOTAS, education other than at school. We've... Um, they're also opting for home ed. We've got a lovely webinar coming up all about home ed um, and what you can do as a home educating parent, um, because it doesn't look anything like school. And it's just lovely. One of our staff members here at, um, at Sunshine, she works here, but also home eds three children. So she works with us part time um, and she home eds her three children. Her children are happy, intelligent content so sociable um and they feel free to express themselves and you know what they've got more life skills than most kids because they're taught the stuff that they need to know um and it does not look like school at all and they've got firm friends they have a lot of friendships it's always very much a, a social uh based thing where i had a very um blinkered viewpoint until I met this member of staff several years ago um had a very blinkered viewpoint about home ed I thought it was literally sat at home not meeting anyone and it's really quite the opposite it looks nothing like I thought it looked and it looks very very attractive so by all means if home ed is something that you're exploring which I know is becoming a very very popular way of educating children and raising them then um come along to that web and I'll just comment below and we'll send you the links um, so I've shared quite a bit this morning. I'm not going to keep rambling on. Um, we are doing webinars in loads more depth than, than anything I've said here. So if there's anything that sort of piqued your interest, just comment and we'll give you the links. I'm not here to sort of uh, 
push an agenda. But I'm going to have a little look at the comments just to see if there's anything. Oh my God, there's loads. Okay. Um, Tamara says the hard hard part. Morning, Tamara. I've just realised I've just read your full name. We've spoken before. Um, the hard part is school saying yes. Of course, we're fair, but you have to go through it, or your child does yourself before you really know. Just a change in who's teaching or TA makes all the difference. Absolutely. One of my friends I was uh, I met with on the weekend. Her son has a TA, one to one TA, and how she was explaining to me uh, their relationship was just absolutely beautiful. As in her and the TA, so they have a little debrief at the end of each day, and that connection is beautiful. Um, but it also means that the school are keeping in touch with us such a lot that it's not affecting, you know, when there is a change, they all work together to overcome it for her little boy. And that makes such a difference. It really, really does. But changes do make a difference. <laughs> it, it can be a make or break for a child's day. Um, Sarah, good morning, Sarah. I'm in exactly the same position, education welfare officer being involved, but my child is struggling so much with anxiety. He wants to go back, but he says his body and confidence won't let him. You see, that that is very much uh self-esteem isn't it um and it's really tricky because a lot of it i can't speak on behalf of all education welfare officers but a lot of education welfare officers and some who sort of self-confess to us will say we know nothing about the stuff that you're talking about we are told we have a target we have to get them back into school and um, we can try and sort of be as gentle as we can but at the end of the day we need to get them back in and nobody realizes that there are options it doesn't have to be that way um keely says this is one of the most amazing things i've watched regarding school oh thank you keely <laughs> uh, that's very kind uh we're here a lot so stay tuned um jane says i would love to know the protocol in managing school threatening fines when your child physically can't attend my child was so ill before christmas then i worry because his immune system is fragile because he's so exhausted and gets ill the school has me worrying about their actions when my son is the priority now i am not a legal expert and i don't profess to be however i do have some legal experts here at sunshine and we are going to be discussing the law because there's quite a lot of different bits that you can pick up to empower yourself to say no you're not going to fine or imprison me or whatever they're trying to threaten to do because i have legal rights we're going to be going through them and my colleague kelly jarvis who heads up our advocacy division she is going to be going through the legalities in a lot of detail next week on the 18th so if you can come to that webinar I appreciate I'm asking you to tune in for something else, but I think you'll find it really useful. We also give all the links to different things. You can store them um, and then you can then refer school to them because they know, they know, and they're just playing a game. Morning, Gabby Sunshine. It's very nice to have you tuning in. Um, Jane also says it's shocking that we have to even deal with the trauma of our children. It shouldn't be a thing. The system is broken. Absolutely agree. Kids' uh, well-being comes before education. Absolutely agree. And by the way, if our child, right, so Bridge the Gap and lots of other amazing people do amazing webinars for us on emotions, okay, and, and the brain and emotional regulation and, and what have you, and dysregulation. Now, there's a part of the brain, I'm going to keep it simplistic, that looks a little bit like the hand, okay, it's the amygdala, and when that is stressed out and that opens up and goes, ah, um, relax kids, uh, which is another organisation, they call it their meerkat, and they've got like this little puppet that they do, goes, oh, 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 it's like we're on high alert. Something's happening. I'm anxious. I feel a little distressed. Ah, okay. When our brain is in that mode, that's the survival brain. The brain, the part of the brain that uh, focuses on good decision making, the cognitive part, that doesn't work. So if we send our children into school anxious, and if a classroom makes them anxious their brain doesn't learn it's a scientific fact you can't what 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 what's the saying where they say uh you know educating in that way is the same as as throwing marshmallows at someone's head and calling it eating it doesn't work um and i think we 
you know, people think that we're hippie or we're modern gentle parenting because um, we are saying that well-being comes first. Scientific, it, scientifically, it has to. <laughs> a child, an adult, they, we can't perform, we can't make decisions, we can't process information if our brain is in survival mode and it thinks that something's going to attack it. It's science. So you're absolutely right. Well-being does come first. Um, Rebecca says she loves the visuals. So for anybody tuning in now, all these visuals available on the website for free, just download them. If you wanted to buy a box, they're not expensive. I think they're around £10, but you get a box of them. Um, so yeah, it's great for schools, actually. A lot of schools buy the box and then distribute them um, to parents at, at coffee mornings and that sort of thing. So yeah, if you ever want any of these visuals, there's hundreds of them. That This is just a small collection. Uh, you can download them on our website. Um, Emma says, I'm in Ireland and we faced exactly the same problems. I always try to show kindness to the teachers as the majority are doing their best. Absolutely. But the system is not working. You're absolutely correct there. First day back to school and my daughter woke up crying in the middle of the night. Totally overwhelmed. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of mine was feeling absolutely okay about going back and then had a complete wobble because now she can't find her shoes. Total ADHD brain. Uh, cannot find where she put these shoes. Um, they could be in Timbuktu for all we know because I cannot work out, even though I've got ADHD myself, I cannot work out where she would have put those shoes. <laughs> they could be in the fridge or the freezer. Honestly, life here, executive functioning in this house. Um, but two of my children... Uh, one in particular was referring her brain back to last term and how she felt injustice and didn't feel safe. And then her twin was feeling uh, sorry for her. And so she couldn't sleep. And it was, oh, what if that happens again? Because she's really caring. So, it, yeah, it, it's total overwhelm. And it affects the entire family. It doesn't just affect that child. It affects the entire family um, and wider relationships. We've got some staff at Sunshine whose children really struggle to attend school. And what's lovely is that working at Sunshine, we all sort of gather around as a, as a nice big Sunshine family and support them through what is really tricky when they have to watch their child going into school that perhaps isn't suitable for them. Um, but it affects the wider community. Not everybody is lucky um, to have such a lovely team of people around them at work and they can rock up at work and just feel like they can't perform all day. Because guess what? As adults, our amygdala is playing up because we're worried about our child, therefore we can't perform our jobs. So the, the, the impact, the wider impact is enormous. Um, let me see. I was offered, uh, Michelle says, I was offered my son could sit in the office as he found it hard to actually go in and mix and leave after he got the AM PM mark. How is that helpful? That's just fiddling the system, isn't it? Oh my goodness. So they want him to go in, sit in the office, then they go, yep, he's here, and then just go home. That is not helpful at all. And when we think about learning, um, as a parent myself, I'm sure many of you do the same thing. I'm always thinking about what can I do to encourage or, or um, upskill my child so that they can take on more at the next stage of their life? You know, just little things like can they load the dishwasher, you know, that sort of thing. Um, what is that teaching him for the next stage of his life? That's not helping him at all. They're literally ticking a box and hand-holding until he's not their problem anymore. And then you're going to have another battle with the next school. Please get in touch so we can have a chat about this. This is just absolutely bonkers, isn't it? Um, Donna says, my daughter has one-to-one -one sessions with a pastoral support assistant who was a safe person at school. She was then used as a cover teacher for a class and told her off. Oh, no. So it broke it. It broke that trust. Oh, it's so tricky, isn't it? And that's a lesson in itself, really. But moving on, how will your daughter ever trust someone again? They really need to have defined roles, don't they? It needs to be, you know, pastoral care needs to almost be a non-teaching member of staff, so it's protected. Oh, that's really tricky. Really, really tricky. 
Uh, Rebecca said she's watching from Wales. I'm from Wales originally. I don't know whether you can hear in my accent. I, I've been in England for a very long time, probably close to 30 years now. So, so old. Um, but I absolutely love coming home to Wales. Julie says, little man went back last week and coped very well. However, according to his teacher, all his worksheets sheets ended up in the bin. <laughs> He's telling them something, isn't he? Luckily, they're trying to accommodate him by allowing him time to regulate. You see, my daughter's a bit like that. I got a phone call. <laughs> I have to laugh because I know what a, how a brain works. I was trying to look for the actual thing. I don't think I've got it. Um, I got a call last term. Um, my girls had had their photo taken and um, it's quite evident that most of my kids like having their photo taken but one of them really doesn't. Um, and we'd said as, as she went in, you can self-advocate. She's very, very strong. She really understands herself. And so we said, you have the power to say, I don't want to have my photo taken. You have control. You have to give consent. And she said, okay, that's fine. But she decided to consent. She was actually very happy and she wouldn't have been pushed into it. That's not the kind of child that she is. I laugh because anybody who knows her knows exactly who I'm talking about. Um, and anyway, she, she did this photo and then she was almost mortified that she'd engaged in it and had this sort of buyer's remorse. So when the photo came, you know, they had the, like, the little picture and then the order form, she ripped it up and she was like, I can't believe I'm smiling on that picture. Um, and when she came home, I said, have your teachers told me that you weren't very happy about it? You ripped it up. And she's like, yeah, I think I had a little moment of madness. But I'm more than happy for you to order the picture if you can put it back together. So the teacher kindly <laughs> placed all the pieces back together and sent me a, uh, like a screenshot of a picture of it. Um, and it was a beautiful picture. But I think she was almost mortified that she'd managed to smile in a picture, which is not her thing at all. Um, but it always makes me giggle when they do these little things because they're not hurting anyone, um, but they're very much communicating something that can be explored later on, but not in the moment. That's another thing. I think, you know, a lot of um, adults forget that when they're when children are in that moment and they're in that moment of feeling dysregulated, that's not the time to teach them to swim, so to speak. What do they say? If a child is drowning, don't teach them to swim. We need to get them out of the water help them recover emotionally physically and then when they're ready address what 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 happened and never talk about it as going wrong nothing went wrong you know what went wrong is not the way to question these things it's i always use what happened what happened it's a very open question with no blame um diane says i sent into school a sensory box for my son to help calm him lanyards etc they used them for a month or so and then they broke up in july and haven't been used since oh it just gets tiring having to go over the old things doesn't it if you have an ehcp you can get those things written into the ehcp which is often quite useful then because you've got something to fall back on um but i would i would probably guess if your son has a sensory box it'd be worthwhile if you don't have an ehcp or idp if you're in wales or the equivalent if you're in scotland or ireland um, it might be worthwhile you asking them, you know, is he on the SEN register? And if so, you will need to have termly IEP meetings and you can review these things in there. Quite, it's quite a useful tool. Um, morning, Sarah from Southport. My nan used to live up there. Well, Wigan. And she used to absolutely love Southport Pier. We spent hours, days on Southport Pier. It was one of her favourite places. Um, Stacy says my daughter has been out of school for months now. And you know what, Stacy, there are options. I don't know any of the context, um, obviously, surrounding your statement there, but there are options. Um, I've been here. One of my children was out for 18 months or more, um, just approaching GCSE age. And it was oh, just thinking about it is quite triggering. But there are options and I wish I knew then what I know now. So get in touch if you need any help. We're here. Um, Jane says, my son, son's school sends out emails for attendance. 100% for the week goes under excellent achievement. You've seen the resource I created. I was the one who creates my fault. Anybody who wants to have a go, uh, the resource with the traffic light system that was based on the traffic light system that comes out every term. That's my resource. I'm very proud of it. Um, and we have it up in our hub as well. Um, 
but that is basically what I've said. By giving somebody a green zone, you're saying, well done on being able and healthy. Some children are in hospital. They can't achieve that 100%. So apparently they're less than. They don't have achievements. The wording, it's the use of the language. Um, there are better ways. Because actually, it's quite discriminatory. And I have pulled up schools on this discriminatory practice before. We had one school in particular get in touch with us because somebody shared with us um, a very discriminatory picture um, about SEND and um, uh, attendance next to a picture about racism and gaslighting and how important it is that we call out gaslighting and racism, which is absolutely important. But it the, the, the picture sort of being quite discriminatory against children with SEND was a complete stark contrast to the one next to it. And so we shared it without the school logo or, or anything on our socials and the school got in touch and promised to take that picture down and never did take the picture down. It's still up, I saw it recently. Um, it just makes me really sad. Um, let's have a look, see if I can find some comments from other people. Sarah says, we've been really struggling since November and my son has been out of school since he had his first major meltdown attacking me and trashing the house. But now he's adamant that he hates school and he doesn't want to go back. And the, you know what, Sarah, I'm really sorry to hear this. Um, and it's it's very likely now that the way that trauma works the events are sort of intermingled in his brain. Um, that first period of school avoidance is now linked with him feeling very dysregulated and hurting you. And whether he has said sorry or not, I appreciate that, you know, being dysregulated is not his fault, but there is accountability that we have to teach them in terms of how they um, react and respond. Um, however, he'll be feeling really guilty now and he won't want that to happen again. So he's linked to two, probably. That's, that's, that's how trauma works. So he's thinking, well, I never want to hurt my mum again and I never want to kick off and I don't want to feel like that ever again. Therefore, I just won't go to school. Um, it, it's just what happens. And that's why it's really important. And I know that anybody who's watched me before, I talk a lot about trauma. It's really important that we address trauma and that we acknowledge it. Trauma doesn't mean that anybody's at fault. Sometimes they are, but more often than not, they're not. Um, and we don't have to attribute blame to anyone. Um, it's just really, really important that we acknowledge it and that we get our children um, trauma therapy. Now, trauma therapy doesn't have to be delivered by a trauma therapist. Sometimes we can do a lot of trauma therapy at home together. Um, and I do talk about this in my webinar next week uh, because I do give some really good ways of being able to um, recover together and co-regulate together. Um, and I do it. Uh, one of the things that I do a lot with my children, I follow something called the six R's of trauma recovery by Bruce D. Perry. Give that a Google. So that's the six R's of trauma recovery by Bruce D. Perry. He's fantastic. Um, and one of them is about rhythm and resonance. And um, we choose songs that we really like. Anybody who's witnessed this thinks we're bonkers. We choose songs that we really like and we have certain dance routines. I can't dance for toffee. <laughs> uh, but we have certain dance routines and we have um, little karaoke competitions and things like that. Um, and as a family, and we are bonkers. And when kids come for tea and they're like, what a bunch of weirdos. But my kids get to re-regulate their systems, recover from anything that might have distressed them during the day. And also know that that kind of wild, crazy behavior is okay. It's okay. They're at home. They're feeling safe. And actually, mum really likes it as well. And so we do a lot of that together um, and we record it sometimes. Sometimes they want me to Facebook live it to close friends and family um, because it's something they're very proud of. They love connecting. And one of my kids um, who's probably got the most complex trauma profile as a send sibling. Um, so it's something she really struggles with being a send sibling. Um, she has really found her voice and she's doing uh, she's in a choir and she does she's just signed up to musical theater and she does lots of dancing and this is a child who didn't feel very worthy at all all she felt that she could do was care for her siblings so 
this makes me really proud, but I think it might have come from the way that we use music um, to recover. Music is so important. Music therapy is one of the best therapies for trauma. Creative therapies are also fantastic for trauma. If you ever get the opportunity to go and do any crafts, just do it. Um, Christmas, I've still got loads of Christmas crafts left over because I always immerse, like hobby craft is like the place we go the most to do these sorts of creative things together. It does work. Sorry, I bang on about trauma a little bit too much. If you watch any of my uh, Facebook lives, you'll see that all I do is talk about trauma. Okay, um, I'll probably have a look at two more comments. Rachel says, I fought for my daughter for 11 years. I found that taking control and instigating meetings, communication rather than wait for them. I will also set the agenda. Yes. Love that. <laughs> so I was to attend a meeting a, a last term and I was hoping for an agenda. I uh, didn't get the agenda. So created my own. Um, and we are seen then as that parent. But I also needed to prepare my child for that meeting. Um, and so if nobody else was going to give me the agenda, I'm not I'm not going to go about blaming anybody for failing my child in that situation. I took the bull by the horn, so to speak, um, and created that agenda and did the prep myself. I think that it's really, really important. We get a lot of messages from people who think the school has failed their child. Um, I'm going to say something quite controversial now, so buckle up. Um, we don't have to allow that. We don't have to allow the education system to fail our children. We have control. The law is on our side. We can also advocate and exercise our rights to the law and our child's rights to the law ourselves. We don't need school to do that. They're not in charge of us. Um, so don't, I remember saying this, Ah, oh, and I cringe over my eldest when I used to say things like, oh, the school system has failed my child. Ah, No, my lack of understanding of, of it, I feel like that perhaps played a part in uh, the system failing my child. I wish I knew then what I know now. Um, and I'm glad that we're in this position where we're able to empower others and, and give you the information, just spoon feed it to you so you're not having to search for hours on the internet absolutely make the agendas instigate the meetings look look out for your rights attend as many learning things that you can you know whether it's reading books attending webinars you know there's so much out there immerse yourself in the world because it will come and get you <laughs> um you need to be in control all the time we can't control a lot of what happens we can't control what people do we can't control what people think what they say but we can respond. We can control how we respond. And that's really important. And I think any good therapist would say that. And part of that is knowing your rights. Um, Alex says, that's so true about EBSA. So we were talking about emotionally based school avoidance earlier on. If you are only now tuning in, please do watch it back. Uh, my girl says she has told them the lights hurt her eyes and make her feel sick. When I looked at the fluorescence, which 90 percent of kids with autism has a physical response to them. So you're right. It's not just emotional. We were sort of saying that a lot of people are saying that, you know, school avoidance or school refusal or however you want to sort of um, coin the term. Well, you know, however you want to de describe it. A lot of people are saying it's now emotionally based school avoidance, but it's not. Sometimes it's physical. Sensory overload is very physical. But go back anyway, rewind the video and you'll see a bit more. Anyway, I've got so many I could spend hours on here, but I, I have overrun my time. And I have got a lot of work to do being back um, just yesterday from Christmas break. So I've got quite a bit. Um, if you need us, get in touch. But like I said, if, if you found this talk useful, you will absolutely benefit from my school avoidance webinar next week um, on the 18th. And you will also benefit from our home ed um, webinar that's coming up next month. Um, and I think sometimes having that gap between the school avoidance webinar, having time to sort of process the information that we give you there, sometimes you can naturally come to the conclusion a couple of weeks later. Yeah, this is what I'm going to do. But how does it look? How does home ed look? Um, so we have got that webinar all lined up for you in February. Um, but if there's anything else that we can help you with, just send us a message. We're here. Or you can request a free advice call through our website. Um, or one of the best tools that we've got is this one. 
the Sunshine Academy. It's got all our best webinars on there. We have live Q&As. We also have a private Facebook group. So if you're a Sunshine, um, a Sunshine Academy subscriber, so if you're signed up to that platform, you do get access to a private Facebook group where our advocates are. So you can ask questions and get answers quite quickly. It's very, very useful. But if you want to go on that, just go to that website there. I don't know whether you can see it. My finger's actually covering it, my Christmas nails. Uh, so it's sunshine-support.org forward slash academy. Again, if you need the link, just ping us a message. Sometimes comments get lost. So just ping us a message um, and we'll get back to you. But have a lovely day. Good luck with the return to school. Remember, there are options. Our children don't need to be forced into a building or institution in order to learn. There are options. Get in touch if you need any help. Have a lovely week. I hope the weather is kind to you and that you're not snowed in. Currently, it's very sunny here. So I'm ordering sun for everybody else. <laughs> Have a lovely day, everyone. Bye.